all of the macros were equated and pretty much everything about the diet was as equal as they could make it. But then between meals, they allowed people like ad libitum snacks, I think was the design. And they found out that people on processed food diets tended to eat more, even though they reported the same amount of satiety, like subjectively. And even though like if you measure the satiety signals in their blood, they were, you know, kind of comparable. These people just could eat more if they were eating processed foods. ¿Qué tal, mi amigo? It's Ted Rice, health expert and host of the Legendary Life podcast. And yes, I'm, I'm aprendiendo español. And uh, that's because I'm still here in Colombia, in Medellín, Colombia. Really excited to be here, eating some great food, meeting some great people. And today I'm super excited to share this episode with you because we're going to be diving into some important information with regards to nutrition. For example, have you ever wondered how much marketing goes on behind the scenes? Because today's guest, Nick Hebert, not only is he the creator of the nutrient density cheat sheet, but he is such a great nutrition researcher that a very popular individual asked him to co-write a book with him and Nick turned him down because of questions about this guy's ethics. In other words, the dude wanted to make a lot of money and was okay uh, kind of fudging the facts. We're going to get into that today. So you're going to hear that story. And some of you are going to know who that person is. So you want to stay tuned for that. Beyond that, we get into just a conversation about nutrition and what's important. And as I said, Nick created the Nutrient Density Cheat Sheet, which is a way to figure out how to get the most nutrition for your money. It sounds like a super cool thing. I really have never heard of anyone doing what Nick has done. So really excited to dive into that with you. Before we get to Nick's interview, I want to say this. If this is your first time listening to, Le to the Legendary Light Podcast, what we do here is we clear up health and fitness confusion by breaking down science-based information on how to lose fat, prevent disease, and live a longer, healthier life. So if that's what you're interested in, you are in the right place. And if you've been listening for a while and you haven't left us a review yet, on wherever you listen to this podcast, please take a couple minutes out of your time to make that happen. It's the highest compliment you can pay us. It helps more people find the show. And if you have any trouble leaving a review, if you try it, got frustrated, you can go to legendarylifepodcast.com slash review. That's legendarylifepodcast.com slash review. We put together some resources for you on how to leave a review so you don't get frustrated. You can give back to the podcast and we've laid that all out for you. This episode is sponsored by Organifi. Do you want to know a secret that all my coaching clients follow? It's really simple, but powerful add vegetables into each meal. But let's be honest, most of us, including myself, don't eat the recommended servings of vegetables and fruits each day. So for those of us who are on the go or have trouble eating healthy, having a greens powder makes it easy to get your greens in every single day, no matter how busy you are. And that's why I use and recommend Organifi Green Juice, a superfood powder that you just add water to so that you can get your greens in even when you're on the go. The best thing about Organifi Green Juice is that it actually tastes great. But don't believe me, try it for yourself. And use the code TED20, that's capital T-E-D, the number 20, at www.organifi.com. That's Organifi.com to receive 20% off your first order. But hurry, this is a limited time discount for Legendary Life listeners. All right, enough talk. Let's get to the interview with Nick Heber. Nick Heber, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Really excited to speak with you today. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, Nick, uh, we, were, we were actually just having a conversation and I was just like, you know what, let's just click the record because this is too good. <laughs> and some of the things that you're going to share with us right now are things that, I mean, I want to hear for the first time and I want to share it my reaction with the listeners, because some of it is just, 
Well, here's the situation. As I was telling you, Nick, the majority of the people who listen to the show, they're in their 40s, 50s, maybe even 60s. They're looking to lose fat, looking to get in better shape, looking to really live that legendary life. But there's so much information out there, and really it's misinformation, right? So much of it. And you have this, you and I, we met on Twitter. Uh, we have uh, we we agree about a lot of things about the really important stuff, and we both come from a place of wanting to help people cut through that. What would you say about the situation out there in terms of information? I think it's extremely difficult for lay people to navigate the nutrition space in particular, um, like the fitness space, the nutrition space. It's very difficult for lay people to actually navigate these spaces because. They don't know how to separate the wheat from the chaff. They don't know how to separate good information from bad information. They have no way to assess, to assess information quality. So it's really easy for people to prey on that and give really, really bad advice, really, really bad information. And unfortunately, a lot of people fall victim to that and then wonder why they're not making any progress. And it's actually, you know, it's kind of sad. Yeah, it's sad because what they end up doing is they blame themselves and they just have no way to really realize that, oh, it isn't me. I'm just getting bad advice. Like carbs make you fat. Calories don't matter. Mm-hmm. There's something special about your my genes or metabolism or maybe the toxins in the environment that's preventing me from losing fat. And then, you know, to bring up, uh, to, to come back to what you said and to a story that I can't wait to hear from you is that there is, I have a feeling that, and this is based on talking to a lot of people, people get really excited about certain individuals in this health and fitness space. And they don't realize a lot of it is just the popularity of that individual or individuals comes down to marketing. Mm-hmm. And you have this interesting story about this one dude in particular who some of the people listening to the show are going to know by name because he's been on a bunch of podcasts. He's uh, does well on social media. He has a book out and this individual wanted to write a book with you. Yes. Could you just, could you, what, what can you share? What, can you tell that story? Okay. So last year, an individual named James DeNicola Antonio contacted me privately. And I guess since, you know, we've kind of had a falling out, so I don't, and his approach to this was kind of nefarious. So I do not have any moral qualms with making this public. This, this guy approached me privately and pitched a book idea. And he wanted me to co-write the book because he liked the way I wrote on my blog. And the book was essentially going to be a rebuttal to fad diets, which is kind of ironic coming from him. And a rebuttal to the carnivore diet in particular. (laughs) And the angle was going to be, what is the optimal human diet? And then he was going to use that as a rebuttal to a whole bunch of different diet fads. And he wanted to focus on the carnivore diet in particular. So a lot of the stuff that he talked with me about was like vitamin C and like manganese and potassium and, you know, typical nutrients that we would be concerned with uh, on a carnivore diet. So he talked with me a lot about that. But the actual conversation that I had with him was very bizarre because he was saying things like, you know, we could get like a quarter million dollar book deal and then we can just split it. And it, the information quality is kind of secondary as long as you can help people. It doesn't really matter if it's 100 percent accurate. It doesn't matter if it's open to amendment, because one of the things that I told him was that I don't think I could ever write a book because I don't like to publish my thoughts in a format that isn't open to amendment and revision because I changed my mind like I changed my pants. So I would never really be comfortable putting my thoughts on paper in a book format. And he was like, oh, no, that's OK. Like, you're never going to get it 100 percent right. Like, it, it's OK if it's you know, like kind of if it plays fast and loose with the facts, as long as it can help people or as long as people as long as people think that they're being helped. And I could tell just by the way he was talking about it, that there was a strong financial motive behind the entire project. I eventually turned him down because I didn't know who this guy was. Um, And after that initial conversation with him, I was like, you know, okay, uh, I'll think about it. And then I looked him up on, I looked him up on Google and the guy's on like Quackwatch. And I, I, (laughs) I, uh, 
got myself familiar with a lot of his talking points. And honestly, I, I read some of the things that he's published to the literature as well. And I honestly was not terribly impressed. So I just said to him, you know what, I have other things to worry about. Thank you for the offer. And I, I, I turned him down just because I didn't really want my name associated with his name. It was just, it was, you know, more than I was willing to do. I, I don't think I could compromise my ethics in that way because I really had a hard time getting behind a lot of the ideas that he was promulgating. And our falling out was basically around me criticizing the publications that he had published in the literature. One of the publications was about sugar being addictive. And the other publication was about vegetable oils causing heart disease. And I pointed out to him in particular seed oils, yeah, yeah, right? quote unquote seed so oils. So crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, I mean, like just ignoring the fact that if you look at the epidemiology around sesame oil, like, holy crap, apparently sesame oil is like an exception to the rule with a seed oil that's like mostly PUFA. So it's like, oh, if you consume canola oil, you'll kill yourself. But if you consume vegetable oil, like you'll be fine because like in the epidemiology, at least. And even in some clinical trials, like sesame oil, like improves a whole bunch of uh, biomarkers and parameters and whatnot. But anyway, so I criticized his publications for being non-systematic. They were narrative reviews of the literature, which basically means that you are free to cherry pick the literature at your leisure and you don't have to apply systematic methods. You don't have to apply a particularly like strong degree of rigor. You can basically just cobble together a narrative or a story that suits whatever you want to get across. And I pointed this out to him that his methods weren't, it weren't terribly rigorous. And I, <laughs> right. and I, I pointed this out publicly and he insta blocked me, which was very weird because we did have a very amicable like correspondence leading up to that point. And he was like, uh, this is just, you're bad for business. Nick. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> bad for business. <laughs> Bye, I'm Felicia. Cut, yeah. It was, it was pretty funny. But yeah, his, his two publications, or at least the two that I'm familiar with, are the one related to sugar being addictive, and I wasn't very persuaded by it because it did not make a very compelling case for sugar being addictive. And the other one was about seed oils causing heart disease, which was equally as unpersuasive because you'd have to ignore giant swaths of human outcome data in order to explain his model or his hypothesis. So I explained this to him, and he just didn't find it uh, he just didn't, he just didn't appreciate it. <laughs> he insta blocked me. That's so funny. And and for those of you who are listening and maybe you don't know who he is, he's made the rounds. He's been on Rob Wolf's podcast. He's been on a bunch of other podcasts, much bigger podcasts than, than mine. Uh, he wanted to come on mine. I said, no, I, I just, I didn't want to talk to him because I mean, it's just his whole thing, at least his book, or maybe he's got another book out. I don't know, but the whole idea was that salt, you, like salt's not bad, just eat salt and actually you need salt and et cetera, et cetera, uh, where there's actually quite a bit of literature showing that, you know, that can be a bad idea. Now, I'm not all read up on on the connection between, you know, heart disease or high blood pressure and sodium. Perhaps, you know, you can go into that if that's something you've read a lot about, Nick. But I, I, I mean, uh, I might I, have one or two comments and so nothing major like well, there was a big randomized control trial recently. Did you see where they uh, where they took out the the sodium chloride, so table salt, yeah. and then put in potassium chloride, and then it improved so, a whole bunch of blood pressure related parameters. Yeah, and that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, the reason that getting too much salt is bad is because most people eat it in the context of not having enough potassium. So, like the old DRI for potassium was 4.7 grams per day. Now it's 3.4, I believe. And the justification for 4.7 grams of potassium a day was that it abolished sodium sensitive high blood pressure when it was tested. So it, like, it, it's not that salt quote unquote causes high blood pressure. Like it certainly can ha it certainly can perturb the blood pressure if potassium intake is insufficient. And I think there are some people who just have a genetic predisposition to be hypersensitive to sodium, and those people probably should restrict, restrict sodium. So there's probably room for truth on either side here. But it's not so much that sodium is bad and sodium is going to raise your blood pressure. It's just having sodium so high disproportionate to potassium, it, it long term leads to poor outcomes related to hypertension. 
not that that's the not that that's the only thing that modulates hypertension, but this wh- where electrolytes are concerned and nutrition is concerned, that's basically the story that's laid out in the DRI report for potassium. Is that it really is about the just getting enough potassium. It's not that sodium's bad. It's just that people aren't getting enough potassium. That's why the the DRI for potassium was so high. Like for some people, especially if you're doing keto. It is super difficult to get 4.7 grams of potassium in a day. <laughs> like even ne- yeah, even no now, kidding. sometimes I struggle with it, especially if I'm in a calorie deficit. Like getting 4.7 grams of potassium is kind of ridiculous. Like you either have to eat like a lot of leafy greens, or or you crush a couple potatoes in a day, but don't eat any other carbs. Just like if you're in a deficit, <laughs> like yeah, you, you kind of have to do some really weird things in order to get that much potassium in a day. It can be difficult. Yeah, without supplementation. Well, the thing is that yeah, suppl- supplementation is actually a, a problem because by law, potassium supplements are regulated to be like uh, uh, only 99 or 100 milligrams, which is only like 1 34th of the, R- of the DRI, of the AI for, uh, for potassium. So like it's because like some people have a reaction to diet to supplemented potassium where they get something called hyperkalemia and they can get a spontaneous like they could like they can they can have heart failure like on the spot by just taking a, a large dose of potassium all at once so like yeah and some people commit suicide yeah. <laughs> by doing that <laughs> unfortunately it's right it, it can be an issue um at really high doses yeah, yeah so yeah you know what i think uh so so that's an important point right get your potassium handled. By the way, fruit is a great source of potassium. So are leafy greens, as you said, so are potatoes. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why, um, you know, the low carb thing uh, annoys me a bit with, and, and I used to be, I, we, you, we don't really know each other, Nick, but I used to be a very strict low carber. I had all the points down <laughs> and, you know, okay, so look at diabetics. What are diabetics? Fat. What causes diabetes? Sugar. Sugar. So obvious because what's diabetes? It's a certain blood sugar level, you know, or hemoglobin A1C level. So therefore, high blood sugar leads to diabetes and diabetes makes you fat. So ergo, sugar makes you fat, right? Yeah. So easy. No, I mean, yeah, they, they and, cobble um, together a pretty uh, compelling story if you're if they're talking to a lay person. If they tried to pull that stuff on me, I would quickly, quickly shut that down. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And, and well, that was the, what I used to believe. And this was, I don't know, or a little over a decade ago. So we have the benefit now of like, well, back then it was very different trying to get the, there's so much more research that's been published. The insulin carbohydrate hypothesis for obesity has been tested and, and found to be lacking in, 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 in data, right? In, in, yeah. In, so anyway, but I used to say that stuff and now I'm, you know, I, I saw the light and, but a lot of people, it's so funny, a lot of the talking points that we used back then over a decade ago, like people are using them now and I just shake my head. I'm like, that's what we were saying like 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And mm-hmm. it's so interesting that, and these are all new people to the low carb thing. Like they've been doing it maybe for five years, 10 years max, but 20 years ago, that's what we were saying because it seems so clear cut. And in def- in my defense, um, some of the research that came out on low carb diets seemed to be extremely promising. Yeah. Now later we figured out that the it, it came down to protein wasn't equated. Yeah. So just for those of you listening right now, when you jack up protein, and the fact that's what you and I were talking about a bit earlier, Nick, when you jack up protein and keep, uh, if you increase the amount of food, uh, amount of protein that you're eating, but lower the amount of either carbs or fat or both, you, you're going to get great results because of the the powerful qualities of protein, mm-hmm. right? On on so many different levels. But now we know the details, and before then, but here here we are, Nick, where all the information is laid out. But you got to be able to one, you got to be able to see clearly, right? You got to be able to see clearly. And there's a lot of people who are emotionally invested. Like I asked you about Ken Berry, who's an absolute nutcase. Yeah. But I asked you, I'm like, what do you think? Is he a true believer? And you said yes. Oh yeah, no. He he and he's in he's got there, he, hook line and sinker, man. Like the guy is absolutely believes. insufferable. Right. So I think that's important to know. Like, because people there are people who are sincere, right? 
They just happen to be sincerely wrong. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And how do you figure that out if you don't know what the evidence truly says? Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you have to say about that? Oh, you know, that's, that's absolutely true. I mean, like, it's really easy to just cobble together a story. And that's what these low carb people do. They cobble together a narrative. They cobble together a story with bits of like mechanistic information and and confounded randomized controlled trials oftentimes. And they just, they cobble together a really compelling story and they personally buy into it. I think a lot of them are, are very genuine in that they, they buy into it and they're honestly thinking that they're helping people but the information itself is very poor quality and they're kind of they're just taking advantage of the fact that people have a hard time identifying good quality information and Ken Berry is a really good example of this Ken Berry the shit he says man it <laughs> blows my mind i'm sur- can you give an example cuz i don't follow him that closely on twitter but I mean, for some reason he keeps coming up in my feed i i don't follow him but apparently some of the people that i'm connected with do well you know what he's so reliable for this information that i could probably just go to his twitter right now and find something crazy a tweet from 13 hours ago most nutrition research is not worth the paper it is printed on okay or uh, some something else has the American Heart Association ever issued a formal apology for the health harm this has caused and pictures of the American Heart Association stamp of approval on cereal boxes? Like, it, it, the guy is just over the top. Right. And, and let's talk a little bit about that because some people might say, you know what, but but cereal is, is, uh, is processed food. That's not good. We should be eating vegetables. We should be eating like how our ancestors ate. We should be eating unprocessed foods. We should be eating whole foods. And for the most part, that is true, right? I mean, it's It's definitely a good, it's, it's good advice, but the, the, it's good advice. The the problem is that those foods are not harmful through the, like those not, those, those foods aren't inherently harmful. And they're certainly not harmful in the way that low carb people like can very suggest that they're harmful. Like they would say it's the refined grain, the sugar content. I mean, yeah, but it's not because the actual starch and like sucrose molecules are bad. That's not actually the reason why those foods are not conducive to health. The foods are not conducive to health because they are typically for the average person, not very filling. And they do not promote satiety in the same way whole foods promote satiety. So people find it easier to overeat on diets that are in, that include processed foods. And that's really the explanation for it when you get right down to it. It's not really the sugar content that matters. It's not the fat content that matters either. Like it's just the fact that these things are very palatable and they don't they don't trigger your satiety signals the same way as whole foods. So th- that those are primary, like primarily the pathways through which these things could potentially harm us. But Ken Berry would say that they're harming us because because they're refined grains and they're sugar. And it's like, well, no, probably not. Because if you equated sugar and gave people whole foods, they probably wouldn't get fat because they would be because because they'd be more satiated, not because the sugar. Explain what you're talking about there, because equated. This episode is sponsored by Organifi. Do you want to know a secret that all my coaching clients follow? It's really simple, but powerful. Add vegetables into each meal. But let's be honest, most of us, including myself, don't eat the recommended servings of vegetables and fruits each day. So for those of us who are on the go or have trouble eating healthy, having a greens powder makes it easy to get your greens in every single day, no matter how busy you are. And that's why I use and recommend Organifi Green Juice, a superfood powder that you just add water to so that you can get your greens in even when you're on the go. The best thing about Organifi Green Juice is that it actually tastes great. But don't believe me, try it for yourself. And use the code TED20, that's capital T-E-D, the number 20, at www.organifi.com. O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com. That's Organifi.com to receive 20% off your first order. But hurry, this is a limited time discount for Legendary Life listeners. Now, back to the episode. Kevin Hall did this really cool study where he 
like he had two groups and I, I believe it was a crossover style design. Maybe I, maybe I'm wrong about that, but basically he fed people whole food diets that were that and then and then uh, processed food diets and they were ad libitum. So that means that there were no restrictions on the total quantity of food that they could eat. But all of the macros were equated and pretty much everything about the diet was as equal as they could make it. But then between meals, they allowed people like ad libitum snacks, I think was the design. And they found out that people on processed food diets tended to eat more, even though they reported the same amount of satiety like subjectively. And even though like if you measure the satiety signals in their blood, they were, you know, kind of comparable. These people just could eat more if they were eating processed foods. And I don't think it has anything to do with the sugar content. I don't think it has anything to do with the with, with the starch content because those things were equated in the diet between the whole foods and the processed foods. I think it probably like my theory about this is that it has to do with the the length of time, like the lag time to full digestion of the food. Like it probably has something to do with the fact that whole foods retain their volume in the GI tract much longer than processed foods. And it's that volume inside of the stomach, inside of the duodenum, like it's the volume that determines whether or not you can cram more stuff in. And that volume diminishes faster with processed foods because they're so much easier to digest. So let's talk, let's open that up a little bit because it's such a, a important point and it's something that I teach in my coaching group, uh, you know, gastric distension, mm -hmm. right? And because that's something you have to rely on. So let, let me, let's unpack that a little bit. So what Nick is saying is this, what really makes you, let's really be simplistic about this shit because it, in many ways it is, if you're hungry, you're going to eat. Yeah. <laughs> and certain foods help managing your hunger, help get rid of hunger better than others. And foods that have high water content, foods that have a lot of fiber, so vegetables, fruits, whole foods, in other words, they take up more space and that leads to a signal to your brain that says, hey, we got a lot of food in here. We're good. So this is a key thing because a lot of the foods that are a bit higher or more dense in calories, they take up less space. That's, you know, they're more dense, right? Yeah. They take up less volume. I know you know, Nick, but yeah, no, no. <laughs> I think a lot, I'm just I'm just kind of messing with it. anyway. <laughs> um, I'm messing with the listeners too. So like, uh, but yeah, and, and so you can eat, you can cram more of this stuff in, and it doesn't lead to like, oh yeah, I don't, I'm I'm not hungry, right? Yeah. And so this is one of the keys. It's not sexy to talk about like the metabolic poison of sugar. Yeah, <laughs> it's not as sexy to talk about as like, you know, carbs causing diabetes and causing your family members to get their toes cut off because of the neuropathy and the, you know, all the other stuff. It's, it's like, no, you need to stretch your intestines, your stomach and your intestines a little bit by eating a higher volume of food. So, so you just have those satiety signals. So you're not hungry and don't eat more. Yeah. It's, it's just like, hard it, sell, man. It, it's a, it's basically a volume to calorie ratio. So like the the more the more you can retain the food's volume in the GI tract per per calorie, the more satiated you're going to be, the less likely it is that you're going to overeat. And you know, it is I personally think it probably ha is just food volume because a lot of people will say that protein is uniquely satiating, but that's not always true. You the whole reason Protein shakes, pro, right? Pro, whey, protein whey protein shakes. shakes. The whole reason bodybuilders rely on protein shakes in order to hit their protein target is because they're not satiating. They allow more opportunities to eat more protein throughout the day because they're not satiating because they're very rapidly absorbed. So like if you actually look at a satiety index that measures the actual satiety factor of each, of each food or a, a set of foods, you find that protein really is all over the board. Like oatmeal gets a higher satiety score than, uh, than a steak and boil potatoes get like the highest score possible on that list. Uh, so it's not really about, it's not really about protein. It's not about carbs or it's not about fat. It's not about any of those things. It's just volume. Cause if you think about the, what the foods are doing in the, in the GI tract, 
Like the foods that break down the slowest are the ones that most promote satiety. The ones that break down the fastest are the ones least conducive to satiety. Yeah, I think uh, so. That's I, I hope that's clear enough for the for for you listening right now. And it's something I teach in my coaching course and my coaching clients, so so they start to understand this because there's so many narratives about nutrition, about the toxins, about the carbs, about and they just don't matter as much as something like this. Is one of the secrets is what I'm telling you is what Nick and I are talking about. And I think another important thing, Nick, I got into it with someone on Facebook. Actually, they were really cool, but I made a post because I was in this entrepreneur event the past few days. And during, get this, Nick, I mean, this is, I actually, I think you commented on it or maybe it was Tyler (laughs) on Twitter, but I had pizza for lunch. And then I, there were two other fitness entrepreneurs there who specialized in body transformations, weight loss, et cetera. Yep. We all had pizza, bro, <laughs> <laughs> and enjoyed the hell out of it. And this guy who kept asking us, oh, so you do body transformation. What do you have to do? He had this salad. I don't even, I don't, I don't think he was enjoying it. And it looked like the salad had more calories in it than the pizza. The pizza looked like a solid thousand calorie pizza or so because the crust was quite thin mm-hmm. and it wasn't loaded up with cheese. It was a, more of an Italian style pizza. And I'm here in Medi- Medellin, Colombia. So, you know, it's, there's, there's not that heavy American influence, uh, you know, with the pizza anyway. So, and then you look at the salad, it's got like several ounces of some dressing that's probably loaded with oils. Not that there's anything wrong with oils, but eat too much fat will get you fat. So, and then, and then all this avocado and all these seemingly healthy things, but it looked like it was maybe 1200 or 1300 calories. Mm -hmm. And these people are like, but I eat so healthy and you're eating pizza. And and they were just like, it was funny. We're all laughing. And it's like, if you miss this, you miss everything. And then it, and then it led to a conversation on Facebook about like, well, Pizza has some things that where, where it could be healthy, but it's not really healthy. And then full sugar soda, I don't, I don't know where that came from. She just brought it up. But it's like something like full sugar soda, it's just empty calories. And I started saying, well, listen, I know there's nobody starving in the United States, okay? Right? In fact, our, our, the people on the lower end of the socioeconomic strata uh, have a higher... Uh, likelihood of be- being obese. So our poor people are fat, in other words. Mm. But in other countries, poor people who are, you know, uh, really poor by world standards, not US standards, eh, they don't have enough to eat. So in a case where a child is going a day without food, having more calories can help them last a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. So maybe in that ca- if you're starving, then any food is good food. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so it's very contextual here. Although there's not a bunch of vitamins and minerals in in pure sugar, I don't think any, right? And even with honey, it's you know, people say there's a lot of potassium. Oh, it's loaded with potassium. It's like, eh, it doesn't really have that much potassium. No, it's not Especially, really that. it's not know, really true, no. <laughs> no, no. So it, there's really this context here that people ha- or have like this West, what I call Western diet culture mentality, you know? Mm-hmm. And what, what do you have to say about that to help people maybe free themselves from like these perspectives that can help? Because uh, we want to see the truth here. We want to approximate the truth, right? We're always going to be a biased and we're human beings, but like what is closer to the truth? What, what do you have to say about calling foods bad and good and healthy and unhealthy? And I think I, I'm just, yeah, I'm not sure. It's probably pragmatic to lay to, to box foods into good and bad categories for the average person. Like there is certainly uh, utility just for the sake of making concise recommendations that are easy to understand. Like if you're trying to get somebody to lose weight and you know, you, you don't have to go into all the nuances with them. It's probably a good idea to just tell them that drinking soda is bad, right? Like for all practical purposes, it has, there's utility in saying that to somebody who needs to lose weight, right? But like if you did want to go into the nitty gritty, it's like, are, 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 is soda bad? No, probably not. It's not conducive to weight loss, really. 
and those calories are probably better spent in other places, but it in and of itself, is it bad? And I would have to say the answer is no, but on a pragmatic level, it, there probably is profound utility in just communicating publicly that like, yeah, these things are bad. Don't, don't drink them. Um, so it's, it's, you have to walk the line between the nuances and the sophistication and just the plain old pragmatism of it. So I agree with you there. I would say this though, the way I look at it, cause I, I do a lot of coaching. And so when people start getting into the good food, bad food thing, you're absolutely right. Soda is not like, Hey, let's do the soda diet because yeah. <laughs> really it comes back to what we were just talking about. It was satiety doesn't help, right? Yeah. It helps because of the water content, but beyond that, the sugar itself is not going to help with satiety. So it's easy to drink a lot of that stuff and then you need to eat because all you did was drink, right? And there's not much of that, you know, volume and gastric distension going on. But at the same time, when people start thinking and I do, I do agree with you. There's just a certain like, hey, so does bad. Stop drinking it. If you're drinking too much, really cut. Uh, probably cutting down um, would would be what I would personally say as a general rule instead of cutting it out. Yeah, yeah. Because I find that the more restrictive uh, an approach is, it's like, well, if someone loves it. Now I don't love soda, but I do love ice cream. If someone said, and ice cream isn't conducive to you could make that argument that ice cream is definitely not conducive. It's even worse yeah. than soda because of all the fat that's in it. Cause I don't get the sugar. I mean the fat free stuff or, you know, frozen yogurt, whatever, yeah. but I'm not going to not eat, you know, ice cream. So just understanding those detail, like understanding, okay, this isn't the best choice, but at the same time I could squeeze it in. If I'm willing to do the work, Willing to do the food Tetris or the food, yeah. you know, budget myself, I can make this work. And there's nothing, like you said, inherently harmful about it. Yeah. No, I'd agree with that. I mean, it, it's, it's very context dependent. So, it, like on a population level, let's say, there's tremendous utility in just saying that so it is bad, right? Because then it scares people away from it. And perhaps you can curb some of the obesity epidemic by just making that blanket statement. But on an individual level, you can likely rationalize with each individual the the caveats and the nuances and say like, no, soda is not like inherently bad, but you know, it's not conducive to weight loss and it's more conducive to weight gain. It's not very satiating. There's a whole bunch of reasons not to consume it, but it's not inherently harmful. Like you can rationalize with people on an individual level about like the quality of foods. But yeah, I would agree that I don't think there really is such a thing as like good or bad foods. Like generally speaking, of course, there are nuances like somebody with a seafood allergy, shrimp is a bad food for them. But assuming you don't have any medical conditions like that, like, no, I don't think there is such a thing as a good or bad food. Yeah, it's, I, I just, and for this, I should have also qualified. I mean, people have been, who've been listening to the show for a while, they're beyond the, hey, stop drinking those six full sugar Cokes a day. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're beyond that. Um, so I should have qualified that too. But uh, good points here. And, and Nick, um, you know, I want to get into a little bit of what, what, what you've done with your nutrient density guide. Can you talk to us about it, what it is, why it's important and how it's different than some of the other things there uh, that are out there that go into like, okay, well, which foods should, or are, are, am I going to get the most nutrition for the least amount of calories? Yeah. Um, so there are a whole bunch of different nutrient density scales out there. Like there's the Andy scale, there is the Nuval scale, there is, you know, there, there, there's a couple of them out there and they all make these fundamental mistakes of injecting unnecessary bias into it. So they'll take, basically, this is the way the equation works for all of these nutrient density scales. They put the quote unquote good nutrients in the numerator and the quote unquote bad nutrients in the denominator. They divide one by the other and it spits out a score. Now you can manipulate the outcomes of that to a huge degree just by mangling whatever nutrients you consider good and bad. So if you want to if if you want to give a hit to animal foods, like if you want to dock points for animal foods, just put saturated fat in the denominator and then all of a sudden all the animal foods get a worse score. Um, if you want to make plant foods look really good, you just 
maybe put bioflavonoids in the numerator and then, oh, all the plant foods look really good. To me, that's just that's not really a satisfactory way of doing it because it assumes good and bad, right? Like what we were just talking about, it, it, it completely divorces itself from context and assumes that certain nutrients are good and bad. Uh, so what I did was I created a scale that's minimally biased that basically this is how it works. There's 600 foods on the list so far. What I do is I take the nutrient yield of a food, and I define the nutrient yield as the nutrient content um, once you factor in bioavailability of each individual nutrient, the, uh, absorption capacity, and metabolic conversion inefficiencies. And we can get into that if you want. But after you factor all those things in, you divide each nutrient by its respective DRI, the dietary reference intake uh, set by the Institute of Medicine, which is how much of the nutrient you supposedly need in a day, and then you take all of the resulting scores for each nutrient per food, you sum them into a score, and you take the scores across all foods, and then you rank them and stratify them into a scale. So in my opinion, this is a minimally biased way of representing the nutrient density of a food as it relates to human nutrition, because the DRIs are where the human nutrition part comes in, and the nutrient yield is where the actual quantitative uh, measurement comes in. And then you just, okay, Related to human nutrition, how nutritious are these damn foods without any further bias injected in? Not even calories, because I think calories need to be considered separately. Calories should not be considered in the equation because all it does is give you a silly little ratio, right? Like a, a poorly nutritious, low calorie food is going to get the same score as a highly nutritious, high calorie food, right? Like, if you divide one by the other, all you get is a ratio. So it doesn't tell you a whole lot about the actual calorie yield of food. So I find that to be just, it, it's injecting too much bias because it assumes that calories are the case. There's one score the cheat sheet that actually gives points to added calories. The bodybuilding score gives points to added calories. So calories are not always bad. And putting them in the denominator across the board assumes that calories are always bad. So I created this nutrient density score, and this was originally a tool for me to just save money. Um, and then I, I have the <laughs> nice, yeah, yeah. So I, I made this for myself, like like a year ago, as a strategy to save money. So I, I quantified the nutrient density of each food, and then I had the price per hundred grams for each food. I divided one by the other, and then it just told me what to buy to maximize my nutrient. It maximized my nutrition for the least amount of money. That was basically what I designed it for. Now the sheet is absolutely gigantic and there are millions of ways to um, personalize and customize uh, your diet just by looking at it. So I have the total nutrition score, which is just a nutrient density score, and then I have it broken up. So I use the same methodology, but for only vitamins, and then I have another score that's only for minerals, one that's only for amino acids, and then I have another one that's kind of cool that's just vitamins and minerals. And the idea there is I wanted to consider foods that you're not going to be expecting to get a lot of protein from. So the way it's set up right now is the, the nutrients that are considered are essential vitamins, essential minerals, essential amino acids, and essential fatty acids. But not all foods are high protein. Not all, not all nutritious foods are high protein. So I have a separate score that removes the essential amino acids so that foods that are low in protein but highly nutritious aren't like forgotten on the bottom of the list, right? So like things like wheat germ and sweet potato and pineapple, those things are at the top of the list when you actually look at the vitamin and mineral content and ignore the amino acids. But yeah, I'm kind of rambling about it at this point. Like there, there is, I'm, there, there, there's a ridiculous really amount of cool, information dude. in here. We should do a follow-up interview after I've had a chance to kind of go through it and then we could talk about it and maybe come up with some, you know, some, some takeaways for, that someone can use right away but then of course you know if you want the whole thing you you gotta go and get it yeah, you gotta yeah. go buy it from nick um so nick dude this was a great first interview 
I would love to do a follow up with you on this, and maybe maybe you and I we can continue our conversation offline and, and talk about some other things as well. Oh, sure. And uh, but I really appreciate you. I appreciate your perspective. And if you're listening right now, Nick's one of the people who are out there trying to sift through the bullshit. <laughs> and what I mean by that is this: it takes effort to challenge your own beliefs. It takes effort to believe something. Then you come across something that challenges your beliefs and you're like, no, that's got to be wrong because I believe the opposite. Mm-hmm. It takes it takes effort and a certain level of emotional intelligence and, I w- and dare I say health to say, you know what? I don't like what I'm reading right now because it goes against what I believe and want to believe quite, quite frankly. But I'm going to set that aside because I have a higher purpose here to help others. And I don't want to be one of those people who are feeding into the bullshit and leading people to these false, you know, these false ideas, false ideologies that ultimately get people into groups and uh, get them together and get them really passionate, but don't get them the results that they're looking for. I mean, so many of the people in the low carn, the low carb and carnivore and the keto groups, they don't get good results, man. But they, you can tell they really enjoy talking about ketones and, and, <laughs> and conversing with each other. Story for another time. But the point is this, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, Nick someone out there who's doing that that diligence as am I, and so he's someone that you want to learn from and want to connect with. So Knitter, uh, Knitter, Nick, I know you are on Twitter, and but I know you have a blog. Where do you want people to connect with you after this interview just to you know, reach out, learn more about you, and, and perhaps uh, look into your nutrient density guide? Oh, so the most reliable place to find me is probably on Twitter. That's where I, um, that's probably the largest point of contact between me and uh, the internet at the moment. So the handle on Twitter is at the underscore Nutrivore, and that's that's me. And uh, you can tell it's me because it says Nick Hebert. And from there, you can find a link to my blog. And from my blog, you can find a link to the, to the Nutrient Density Cheat Sheet. And you can find links to all of the other ways to contact me, uh, including my email address. So... The most reliable way to access all of my social media is probably just to go to my Twitter page. Excellent. And I'm going to have that on the show notes, Nick. And uh, man, really, really glad that you and I connected and that, you know, we, we, what I feel is like we really have to band together and um, to make sure that people are getting the best information out there. Because I, I don't want people to fall into this. I, I have got a client from Quitter. Uh, Quitter. I'm really mincing my Twitter. Every time I think of Twitter, I'm like merging it with another word. But like I have a client who came from Twitter and he's just got so many misconceptions about seed oils and other things. And I have to very gently, I have to lead with results, but very gently kind of nudge him towards you know, the fact that these things that he believes are not true and not even that important. Yeah. And we, we don't want that. Yeah. We don't want people falling prey to that. I think like a lot of people lose like 95% for 5%. Like a lot of people are really focused on the 5% optimization before they have even laid down a foundation. Like if you're talking about seed oils and sugar, but you're not lifting weights, like you're it's it's just noise. It's, you can it's, stop right yeah, there. It's silly. <laughs> right. It's silly. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, hey, it was a pleasure. Can't wait to have you back on the show. And thanks so much for taking the time out to do hey, this. No problem, man. My pleasure. That wraps up another episode of the Legendary Life Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the, the interview with Nick. Nick is someone who I can't wait to have back on the show. He's really done his due diligence when it comes to understanding nutrition and diving into the literature, the place where we inform ourselves about what is true, what is not when it comes to nutrition. So I hope you got a lot lot out of that conversation. Can't wait to get him back on the show. And I want to say this, nutrition can be complicated, but if you are having struggles trying to get yourself in shape and you don't know what to believe out there, but you know that coaching is the way to get to the next level of health, of fat loss, 
the next level with your body, the next level with your energy levels. And you've been listening to this podcast and you know I might know a thing or two about how to do that. What I want you to do is I want you to go to legendarylifeprogram.com slash apply and apply for a call, a breakthrough call. And on this call, you and I are going to discuss what's working for you, what's not working for you, and where you want to go. And if I can help you get there, I may invite you into one of my coaching programs. But if not, that's cool too. And I want to be really straight about who this is for. If you are an entrepreneur, business owner, or other high performer, and time is money to you, and you don't have time to read a thousand different blogs, listen to you know 700 different podcasts to figure out how to get results, if you want it done for you with an expert who has a proven system and has helped every single person who's come through his program, you're who I want to talk to. So again, that that address is legendarylifeprogram.com slash apply. All right. Hope you enjoyed today's interview. Have a great week and I'll speak to you on Friday.